Right, so thank you, Adrian, for that introduction and for the invitation to talk about work uh, about making old data more useful. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of the historical global surface temperature change, but um, but this is this is uh, things I'm going to talk about are far more widely relevant as well. I'm going to talk about why it's difficult to use historical data, and I'll show you some examples of some of the data issues we we have to um, we have to worry about, and I'll show you some examples of why we need to retain complexity uh, in the data sets. It's very tempting to be able to to simplify everything, but I will argue that that complexity is necessary to make progress in understanding um, the real world. I'll summarise how I, I think we need to make progress and we need resources for a continual process of expansion, evaluation and importantly revision. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't treat these, um, these things as a, a, a one, one shot only. We need to make sure that we we can learn from, from our experiences and revisit, um, revisit everything. And we need to make that easy to do. And what we really need to do is to break open the data system to allow wider participation. And I'll briefly uh, consider who would benefit from doing this. So first of all, my example, historical global surface temperature change. So many of you will be familiar with the most recent um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, which concluded, was able to include it conclude this this time for the first time that that it really is us um, we are causing the warming and we can see in the plot on on the left that um, this uh, this data this um, recent warming is uh, unprecedented over thousands of years and in on in the right in the uh, sort of period that I'm most uh, involved in, with in the last um, tens of decades we can see that uh, it's clear that we need uh, to include human um, human effects in the climate models, uh, the sort of brown colour, uh, to make them match the observations which we see in black. And if we don't include those um, those uh, human effects, it include only natural effects, we get um, we don't see the recent warming. So so on that you know on on that uh, standard, that's great. We we can use the data to um, conclude that humans are affecting climate. So uh, focusing in on the observations now, so these two plots are the same data, but then anomalies uh, relative to different periods, which uh, emphasizes differences in, in, different, um, in different periods, uh, but essentially the data are the same. These are from a recent paper describing the Hadcrew T5 global temperature data set. Uh, so we can see we've got uncertainty shown by the grey bands, and we can also see differences between the different data sets, which is larger in some periods than in others. So focusing in again, we have the sea surface temperature contribution. So this is the marine contribution to that, um, that global time series. And this is from the HAD SST4 uh, data set. So if we look at the... Um, if we look at the time series on the top left, we can see that uh, the unadjusted data shown in, um, in red is, is a lot cooler in the earlier period. So we've got some, some substantial bias adjustments that we need to make to the data. But when we've done that, you know, the, the three different um, estimates from three different organizations, so we have the Met Office, NOAA, and the Japan Meteorological Agency contributing um, data sets of this, this sort of length to the, um, you know, that they actually produce data sets of this length. Uh, we can see that we have, you know, broad agreement, but we've also got some differences and that's um, shown regionally um, and um, actually plotting differences of the different data sets uh, in some of the other panels. So you can see that, you know, we don't quite understand what's going on at every level. And we can see that actually some of the differences uh, extend beyond the um, grey uncertainty ranges. So, you know, there's there's more work to do. Some of this is due to biases in the data. Some of this is due to data sparseness. Um, but we can see that um, even at the global scale, uh, we've got some work to do to try and uh, improve the data. So going back, just looking at the global, um, the global data sets, 
again and focusing in on the um the legend we can see that actually we've only got two contributors to the marine contributions to these uh, data sets in red i've uh, outlined those da global data sets that use data from the met office and in blue those from noaa so we can see we've got two uh, major major contributors here in the uk the met office and in the us noaa so if you contrast this with, this is from the appendix of the recent IPCC report, and this shows, um, this is a table summarizing all the institutes that, that have contributed uh, to the historical simulations in CMIP-6, which is the uh, model archive that underpins the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, assessments. So we can see there's a lot of different models, and you'll see that in the ensemble spread, for example, that's presented um, in, in the analyses, and I counted 40 institutions and 60 models uh, contributing to the IPCC. So the question this raises to me is why have we got 20 times more institutes contributing coupled climate runs than we have SST data sets? And I would argue that this is largely because it's difficult to use historical data. So this is a paper, uh, a figure from a paper we contributed to OceanOBS conference in, in 2019. Uh, so I'm not really wanting to focus on the detail here, but you'll see, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, not lots of different things you need to consider. Um, but what's also important is we've got lots of feedback. So we've got lots of arrows going from the end of the process back to the start of the process. So we've, we're trying to build in this process of, of re-evaluation, repeating, improving. So on the top, uh, the top box I've highlighted in um, red is all about um, choosing your data. I mean, this might be very simple. You might be using a single data source or you might have to spend a lot of effort um, gathering together many different data sources, evaluating them, revisit, revisiting that choice, for example. Uh, the second, the, the middle red box is all about understanding and characterizing the data. Once you've selected it, you need to take a look at it, you need to understand what you've got, you need to estimate uncertainty, you need to see if there's any problems, fix them if you, if you can. Um, estimate and apply bias adjustments and evaluate consistency and only then can you move on to constructing the product and when I'm talking about product I mean something like had SST4 a gridded uh, monthly so gridded uh, had SST4 is uh, five degree latitude longitude boxes and monthly uh, monthly values so once you've done all of these steps you can start um, thinking about smoothing gap filling estimating the uncertainty in the gridded fields and then evaluating, um, evaluating the result. Uh, and then you can uh, feed the data or the products uh, to users. Uh, and you can actually use some, for example, if your data help improve reanalyses, you might be able to use that reanalyses in your, your quality to provide limits for your quality control. So there's some very strong and virtuous feedbacks here. So, if you're constructing a um, gridded data set, um, I've put here a, a representation of a data volume that you're interested in. So this will be a space and time volume and you'll have some observations in that. And the variability you see in those observations is gonna be a mixture of real variability and that might be at different scales. It might be systematic, it might be um, it might be random, you might understand it very well, you might have very little information about it. And then on top of that, we'll have some variability in the data due to data artifacts. And I've listed some of the things that uh, uh, you might worry about under data artifacts. So, so the challenge or one challenge of constructing data sets is to look at the, the variability, um, the differences in the data you have, and try and understand whether they're, they're due to real variability or to data artifacts, and then how you're gonna handle that in your analysis process. So what about the data itself? I mean, actually getting hold of data is, is a balance between accessibility uh, versus complexity. So on the left, I've shown a screenshot from the Copernicus Climate Data Store. So here you, you can you know, simply click on a, a variable, 
whether or not you want data that have passed quality control, select a year and a month and then down your, download your data. Um, but this will be in a very simplified format. So underpinning uh, the, climate, the Copernicus Climate Data Store is some work we've been doing on um, a climate data, sorry, a common data model. So uh, there's a flow chart there that shows uh, the complicated structure of this common data model, but it allows you to represent some very complex uh, data structures in a consistent way. Uh, and I will show you later in the talk why it's important that we retain this complexity. So um, in the marine domain, we've been very lucky that we've, we've had an archive that has collected together all the data or a lot of data. Uh, it aims to be comprehensive uh, and uh, converted it into a common format. Uh, so translated um, various coded and coded information and information in, uh, in for example, temperatures in Fahrenheit uh, to give a simple example. Um, and then they've uh, converted all of that to a standard and again, very complicated format. Um, so what's actually in ICOEBS? I mean, if, if you look at the indicators in there, there's about 300 different uh, sources of data, and these will have come from very many different, um, very many different uh, sources. So a lot of the uh, older data will have come from logbooks, and originally these will have been processed just by, um, by hand, um, compiling information to give you uh, charts and um, climatologies of uh, various variables. Um, later on, it was recognized that uh, to make the data more useful, it needed to be in digital form. And the first way this was done was actually using punch cards. Uh, so I've got some examples of punch cards. So you can see there's some compromises and choices that have to be made going from the logbook to the punch cards. I mean, while punch cards are much easier to store, you can see in the, um, the picture of the uh, the entrance hall to one of the NOAA buildings. I mean, this is full of cabinets, full of punch cards. So while this is great in that you can actually read this data, um, machines can read this data, we've still got a massive data storage problem. Uh, moving on, we, we then have um, tapes. Uh, many of us, or some, I started my, um, my career when, when tapes were used to exchange data, um, but, even, even when you've uh, converted your data from punch cards onto tapes, you've still got a, a lot of tapes and they actually require a lot of maintenance. They need to be re-spooled, for example, uh, or else they um, um, eventually will deteriorate. Um, something I was unaware about is some of the data sources actually come from microfilm images of punch cards. And you can imagine how, um, how the data quality might be degraded by that process, but we actually have quite a lot of uh, data in ICOABS that's come from, from microfilm versions of uh, punch cards. Other data comes in through electronic logbooks. So we have a, a picture of um, the, the data entry system that, that ships contributing to um, weather forecasting uh, will have used. Uh, these came in in about the 90s, so you, you basically typed in the numbers and those got formatted for you and sent off. And we also have data from um, delayed mode, for example, uh, data assembly centres. So all of these different types of data have been read in and converted to a common format. And we mustn't forget the modern uh, data system. This is the report card from the uh, OceanOps, which monitors the modern um, data system. So some of this data, for example, Argo was designed with integrated data management. That was that was clearly part of uh, part of how Argo was was set up. Uh, for example, for the voluntary observing ships, uh, we rely on national archives of GTS data. So there isn't uh, an organization that's tasked with um, with archiving and understanding that particular data source which actually makes a huge contribution to the global uh, climate archive. 
So digging into ICO ads, I mean, when this data were all on tape, I mean, this just couldn't be done. So now we can we can read all the data in and we can just we can just look at it. Uh, you know, so even at this very basic level, this is the you know the first time this has been done. So we just we can we can look at where the data are, uh, when when they were recorded, we can understand what sort of uh, platform they're from, are they ships, are they boys. Uh, which variables have we got in the data set? Uh, what's the precision of the location information? And was the, you know, what's the sampling interval? And is this in local time or UTC? So all of these things are important. And here we have an example of a summary we came up with. Uh, and the example is the East India Company data. So this data, um, the bars show that this data comes from the late um, 18, 1880s uh, through to the late 1850s. 1830s, uh, we can see that they're data from ships, uh, that's indicated by the purple rather than the pink bars, and we can also see the variables we have a, a pressure, air temperature and winds. The bars at the, um, by the side of the map show us that the, uh, the decimal points in, in, lo in longitude are well represented, um, and we have observations only at, at local noon. So we can look at different data sources. Here we compare the East India Company with uh, and other data of a similar period, and we can see that the Maori data uh, is, is much more um, uh, geographically distributed, and we have more, um, more observations throughout the day. Uh, it looks like we've typically got five observations uh, per day, which is great. Um, and we can see this data is, is before the opening of the Suez and the Panama canals, which uh, dramatically affects the data distribution. As you can see here, this is some slightly later data from the Netherlands, and we can now see data you know, following the, the main shipping tracks, um, but we can also see that those have changed due to the opening of the Suez and Panama canals. We can also see we've got um, some boxes missing uh, and this is actually due to tapes that were misplaced. And sometimes it means that we lose the data uh, forever. Uh, but in this case, at least some of the data um, have appeared uh, in a later processing. So it was realized that these, these observations and these particular uh, associated with these particular tapes, which are particular regions, uh, have, have been found. Uh, one thing also to note is that the IDs are missing. We don't have any information about which data uh, which ships these data came from and this is because the date the ship name was written on the back of the punch card uh, and the data was stored by date order for particular ships so and when it was digitized that was lost we could have maintained the order of the data but then they were reorganized uh, into regional tapes so we've ended up losing that data so for this these observations we don't have a record of, of which particular ship made the observations. Just another couple of examples, Norwegian data um, is, is global. This is um, starting in 1867, uh, but obviously focused uh, around Norway uh, and tuna vessels um, are focused in the, um, in the tropical Pacific. And one thing we might note about the tropical Pacific data, these are from porpoise logs, so they're made during the day. So we can see those we only have between local hours of, of um, 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. corresponding with um, corresponding with daylight hours. Um, even at this simple level, we can we can look in and, and see some data problems. So on the, the right, uh, sorry, on the left, we have um, off the coast of uh, South America, you can see um, a rather odd data strip. And actually this is data that's been mislocated by 10 degrees. It should actually be 10 degrees further east. So just looking at the data, we can identify problems. And in this case, we can fix them uh, quite easily. But uh, another data problem that's proved a bit more resistant is the Russian Meteorological Archive. Um, and here we can see superimposed on the, uh, the, the now familiar shipping lanes, we can see we've got some geometric structures uh, which are organized by five degree boxes. So we've got data missing and we've got extra data where we don't expect it. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So we have these many, many different data sources and we can merge these together um, 
we can, when we've merged these together, we can identify data duplicates. And by a duplicate, I mean a, a different version of the same original observation. Um, so these, sometimes they're easy to identify, but each, each different report will vary uh, according to the journey it's made through, through data management. So we'll have rounding, we'll have different conversions, we'll have some missing parameters and metadata. And there'll also be some systematic differences. So I would argue that if we can reprocess from the original data sources, we can fix some of these problems, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and generate a better uh, data source. So these, these duplicates can help us resolve data problems. This is revisiting that Russian data. And we can see that we have lots of duplicates of that Russian data with other sources. And what I've shown in the maps on the right is in the red, we have boxes where we identify Russian data as duplicates in time and data contents, but not in position with other sources. So we can see that these five degree boxes have been moved around. And now we know that we can, we can reprocess, uh, we can try and fix this, but hopefully in due course, we'll be able to get a, a version of the um, Russian, a new version of the Russian data set. And, and one reason why we don't have IDs for the Russian data set is because um, they couldn't handle the Cyrillic characters. So that's another issue that's um, important to consider. So we have these complex data uh, sources. So why do we need to retain this complexity? So going back to Hadis ST4, this shows the uh, estimates of the globe of the bias adjustments that are needed globally. And this is due to um, the observations made in, in many different ways over the period. Uh, but typically the early observations were made uh, from ships uh, using buckets, a sample of water was taken uh, in the bucket. And later on, um, although buckets still contributed, we get more and more observations, uh, finally from drifting boys, but also from uh, ships making measurements of inlet water. So this is a cartoon that John Kennedy produced. Um, and this shows some of the things that you, you want to think about when you're considering bi bucket biases. And I've just uh, circled in blue, the ones that are metadata uh, and in uh, orange, the ones we need data to understand. So for example, it's very important if we, if we have cloud information, we can estimate the solar radiation and, and that obviously during the day will affect um, the temperature of the water in the bucket, but we've also got cooling by evaporation, which also depend, depends on the environmental, the local environmental conditions. So it, in addition to keeping the temperature measurements, we need to keep all these observations of other variables uh, because they're interesting in their own right, but they also help us understand the uh, temperature data. And if we've got information on the instructions that were provided to the, the users, uh, to the, the observers, or the um, information about the type of bucket, you know, that helps as well. And if we can embed this in the, along with the data, that will be really useful. We need to focus on individual ships. So this is a uh, taken from a, a paper in 1948 where they tested different buckets in a wind tunnel. Uh, so these were buckets that were used in, um, by different nations at different times and the steepness of the curve uh, so steeper curves show greater heat exchange uh, with the atmosphere so we hope see we just have very different characteristics and different data sources but the problem is as i said earlier we don't have ids for all of the, the data so this uh shade this plot shows the shaded region where we have ids and we can see that we have quite substantial uh, periods where we don't have ID information for our ships. So my colleague, Julia Carella did some work where she actually tracked the ships. Um, and we see we can do quite a good job of um, improving our ability to understand uh, which individual ship uh, data, which individual ships uh, observations should be clustered together. Uh, you'll see some periods where this didn't work very well, uh, and in the later period, around the 1960s, this is some example, examples of some of the data from the early global telecommunication system providing data for weather forecasts. Um, so we can see we've got lots of mislocations, and uh, 
we have, um, for example, many blue, uh, blue circles indicating cold sea surface temperatures in the tropics where we don't expect them. I mean, this has been massively cleared up, uh, cleaned up uh, in the archives we see now, um, but I'm sure we could do a better job of this now than, than they managed um, a few decades ago. So reminding us why we care about this, um, the adjustments that need to be applied to global data sets um, depend on measurement method and also depend on environmental conditions. So we need to embed that information in the, um, in the archives, uh, but it's often missing. So what can we do then? Um, well, because the environmental conditions and the measurement methods affect the data, we can actually look at the data and try and um, understand measurement methods uh, from the data itself. And this shows this uh, plot here, which shows uh, anomalies um, throughout the day uh, in blue from different data sources show that we have really small uh, diurnal cycles from the data we get from engine intakes and hull sensors, but the buckets show really uh, strong diurnal signals. So this gives us a way into um, uh, selecting metadata where we don't have good information. Um, Duo Chan extended this. Um, so in the uh, scatter plot, we see uh, we can see he's plotted anomalous diurnal amplitude against the offset. So we saw that engine intakes are typically warmer than buckets, um, and they also have lower diurnal cycles. So now we've got two indicators that we can help uh, to understand the metadata. Uh, and we can also see that we've got some um, dots that don't fall on this neat line. Um, uh, relating the diurnal cycle to the mean offset. And the, um, the reference manual um, image that's in the bottom right uh, shows an example of why this might be. Uh, this is a certain case where it, when the Japanese digitize, digitize one of their data sources, they actually uh, truncated the temperatures rather than rounded them. And Duo found that the, um, the Japanese temperatures were indeed cool. So what do we do? Um, to make progress, I'll argue that we need to expand data coverage, we need to fix the data problems we have, and we need to make sure we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. So this is uh, probably an obligatory figure. This is from the NERC digital strategy, showing how data are collected, uh, gathered together, and then analysed. Um, most of the data we're considering here fall under other data sources. We have data rescue, reprocessing, um, I can't read that, data exchange and observations of opportunity. And what I mean by observations of opportunity is we have ships um, contributing to uh, making weather forecasts in a formal process, but they also make observations of the environmental conditions for their operations. And people are starting to um, think about how they can gather that information and whether that will be useful in providing, um, finding more global information. So um, expanding data, uh, Old Weather is an example of a uh, data rescue portal um, hosted by Zooniverse. There are many of these uh, different sorts of activities recovering data. And this is an uh, open example, so you can contribute to this. This is Weather Rescue at Sea. And this is showing examples of the instructions uh, that are provided to the people um, digitizing the data. And this is actually, um, this actually is, becomes part of our metadata. So we have lots of lots of information and not all of it is transcribed. So it's really key that we, for example, when we've digitized this data, we make sure that anybody looking at the data, if, if they want to, can actually link this back to the image that we, uh, the image that we have and any metadata that we have describing how the observation was made. We don't always have, um, can't always rely on volunteers. So this is some work that's been done, being done at Southampton University under GLOSAT trying to automate data rescue. So here we have an example of um, some tabular structure. This is often what we get. And optical character recognition can often struggle uh, differentiating the text from the tables. So they've done some, some work trying to um, reliably pull out structure from different sorts of um, different sorts of um, tabled data. Um, 
but then the next step is to see whether having understood that structure we can um, use the characteristics of what we expect to see um, in each part of the table um, to improve the optical character recognition so for example we if we know what what sort of data metadata we're expecting to see in a certain part of the table we can improve um, we can prove how the um, how the optical character recognition is working and also we mustn't forget the the modern observing system we don't have um, archives for all of the data sources that contribute the modern the observations uh, we use uh, to understand climate. So what are the, the data system requirements that we have? Um, we need to retain the original data and metadata. Um, before we do anything, we need, um, we need to be able to archive that. And that, I think that will require a bit more flexibility on, the, um, on data centres, um, because these things are not always going to conform to the standards that they, they would like. We always need to keep everything together and be able to link to seeing documentation. So if we find uh, something interesting in the data, we can we can look at the documentation, the metadata, all back to the original logbook or images. We want tools to be embedded in this. We need QC visualization. We need to improve our duplicate identification and feed all of this back into improving the data. So we need tools for conversion to standards. So we need um, we need fixed ways of of extracting wind speeds from both at scales, converting units and um, understanding the tables that were used uh, to make the old data formats more compact. We need access to external data sources so we can see how our observations look in the context of other observations. And we need feedback loops to fix processing problems and data collection issues. And the quicker we do this, the more likely it's able to be fixed by someone who has some knowledge uh, about the situation. And we need to be able to do this for a very wide range of data and formats. So uh, I tried to visualize this, and I think it is better in my head than it has actually appeared on the screen, um, but I've tried to show the current data system. Uh, so in terms of data quality, so green might be good, red might be not so good, um, different formats in different shapes, different bits missing, um, and, uh, some documentation uh, that may or may not be embedded in the, the data. So the ICOADS approach was to fit this all into a standard format. So we might lose a bit of information. We might be able to carry across some of the metadata. Um, every, things were kept, but often separately, and those might have been um, might have been lost over time. And the formats that ICOADS have used are not um, are not compliant with modern metadata standards. And it's a bit of a grey box. We have detailed information about what's been done, but it's actually quite hard to, to piece it all together. So what I'm envisaging is we take the same data and we actually manage to keep all of that information uh, within, a, with a, within a common data model framework. From this, we need, we need to be able to e extract data in, in uh, more uh, easy to use formats, but, but we need a system where we hold all this information. Um, in its original form, and we can link back to um, other pieces of information. So we need to keep the original data, we need to harmonise, we need really strong links to the metadata and documentation, and this all needs to be supported by open source tools, and we really need to focus on allowing for improvements. So I'd argue that we need some sort of hub, um, so people can start asking questions, you know, are the data I've got already in the system, can I contribute, I've got a great idea about how I can improve QC, you know, can you use it, here's some new documentation, anybody notice this problem, uh, here's a fix, um, you know, the, the, somebody's uh, made, done some work on their archive and they've got a new version, and you know, we've got all these complicated conversion tables, you know, that information might already be in the system, so you know, this idea that we can take all these fragmented parts and put them together and, um, you know, have an information generator sort of searchable information system where we can, you know, use this to understand the data. So in summary, um, we need more data. We need resources for data rescue, uh, both citizen science and automation. And importantly, we also need to reprocess the data we also have in digital form, and we need to discover the data that we, we don't even know we've got. 
We need systems that can handle it, varied, multi, mul varied multivariate data with rich metadata. And importantly, we want no loss of information. Data centers need to be resourced to contribute to this um, and also provide secure archives. Um, at the moment, um, uh, some, not all data rescue activities are firmly embedded in, in the data system. And we also need to uh, worry a bit more about how we store uh, data extracted from, from near real-time exchange system and increasingly from these sort of third party um, observations of opportunity. And I think it would be great if we could have a collaborative hub to bring together the data and metadata software and data visualization tools. So we can build the knowledge base and pool effort internationally and broaden experience so that we can take, um, you know, so, so people can, can contribute even if they can't, um, can't complete the whole end to end process. So just to, to summarize that again, we need a lossless data system. Uh, we need resources so that we can reprocess and it needs to be modular so that if somebody can make a contribution in a small area, that can be used. We need libraries of metadata and documentation and these need to be clearly linked to the data, lots of tools and a, and a hub to focus the fragmented um, international activities we have in these areas. And the advantages then, if we, if we lower the barriers to data use, it'll allow us to use advanced statistical techniques, allow others to use adv advanced statistical techniques. So again, broadening this pool of expertise so we'll have an expanded diversity of data products and we'll have those feedbacks uh, from this, these new analyses to improve data quality. And I will argue that, that there will be a, a huge return on any investment. We've got piecemeal activities, which is always very inefficient. We'll, um, if we improve the data, we'll have better data for and from reanalyses, which will reinforce improvements in the data and for modeling evaluation. And at the moment, People are spending research time discovering um, data problems, which they can't necessarily fix. So if we can actually sort out some of these problems, actually uh, research will become much more efficient. So uh, I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Liz. Fascinating stuff, really good. Um, so I, I do have a, a number of questions for you, Liz, if I may just work through those. Um, so um, the, the first one was um, just, just thinking right back to the start of your talk, you looked at SST anomalies over time and the, um, the discrepancies between the different SST data sets. Um, it, it struck me that those don't really appear to decrease over time, yet you might expect with better coverage and better um, technology for observing things, you might expect those data sets like naively to get sort of closer over time, but they don't do that. Is there, is there a reason why those discrepancies have not come down in the more recent period? So the issue there, I mean, that's actually just a, uh, so what happens is you, you need to um, relate uncertainties in each period. So we actually, for sea surface temperature, we've actually got a great observing system now. We've got high quality data from satellites. We've got drifting buoys. Um, but the problem is relating uh, that uncertainty that we have now to uncertainty in earlier periods. Um, so what people are doing now is actually referencing things towards the end of the, the record. Uh, so the uncertainty sort of appear in the right place. So the uncertainty associated with, um, with the differences between the 1950s and now sort of appear in the 1950s rather than as a, as a uh, expanding um, uncertainty range but the problem is we then are interested in um, temperature change since the pre-industrial so then uh, we need to reference that to the early data which is actually the most uncertain so you end up squashing the uncertainty in the, the period you're using as a reference and it and it has to pop out somewhere okay. well, thank you. Um, a question about the uh... Uh, yeah, how, how do we manage the issue with the, the lack of progeny of the data? So is it safe to assume that methods were, were broadly the same from different platforms? 
to some extent. Um, I mean, we have very little information about the types of buckets that were used earlier, um, and each engine intake has, you know, the character. You know, it's, it's to do with the internal plumbing of the ship. So um, even if we have sort of good metadata, there's going to be a huge diversity between between the ships. Um, and also, even if you're using the same bucket, um, how you how you use it, how long you leave it on deck for, all these things are important. So what we need to combine is is excellent metadata or the best metadata that we can find with techniques that can dig into the data and understand uh, from the characteristics of the data. So we need high quality data where we where we can look and, and see see the see what the effects of the environment on the data are, and then pull out that information. Um, you know, and then apply that knowledge to estimate uh, methods and biases for other observations. Thank you. Um, uh, poss possibly a slightly related question. What, what are the challenges of drawing together all these data sets from different sources and how are the relativities in accuracy and different methods factored in when creating a coherent merged data set? Well, that last problem is basically why there are so few merged global data sets. Um, so, we, know, we, we have to work with what we have, and this is why it's so important that we, we basically get as much information as we, we can to describe any data source. So sometimes, you know, that will be very limited. Uh, and what we really need to do is rather than start using you know what what i hope we can do over time is is revisit all of the sources that have gone into icoads which which typically then just get used i mean we a, a few were excluded where we have particular problems and people have excluded that russian data in certain areas and things like that but we really need to start looking at the data and saying you know is is this is this helping you know is this really going to give us new information um and useful information or actually you know should we just we just you know this just mark this down as as not not useful so it's really just making sure that we we carry as much information across so when we start evaluating different data sources against each other and they disagree we can start thinking well you know we know that that one's a bit compromised you know we've got good metadata for this one so it's just a case of trying to bring all that that information together and then making some um, expert uh, judgment about uh, which ones you should, uh, which which data you should prefer. Um, and often none of them are perfect, um, mm -hmm. and it, but it's really what I, I think the real benefits will come if we start uh, splitting off these data management issues uh, from the bias issues. So at the moment we're, we're, we're handling them all at once. So that's why the, the work that Duo Chan did was very nice because he was uh, he was trying to understand the differences he saw in terms of physical characteristics of the biases, um, and he couldn't understand it because he thought there was you know he's thinking these, these buckets are just cooling massively and actually it was because the data had been truncated. So it's trying to understand the the you know so if we can understand you know if we make sure that's embedded information is embedded in the data system um, when people find things like that they can they can clearly relate it to to the real the real culprit rather than trying to come up with a model of a, of, of the worst bucket in the world yeah cool Excellent. um a question about um observation data collected by commercial companies because that's often subject to ipr or non-disclosure so how will this be addressed for archive data that's digitized, which might give rise to new IPR and future data collection? And noting also that government data may be open source, but a lot of the monitoring is contracted out to private companies. So um, some of we've uh, up till October, um, the UK has been contributing to the Copernicus project, but sadly after that, uh, that will uh, cease. But one of the things that this is particularly important for, for land data, because land data is uh, clearly owned by nations. Um, so they have put a lot of work into um, making sure that the IPR, uh, when it's known, is, is firmly embedded. So that's something else I haven't really talked about. But, but you know, that's another piece of metadata. You know, can this, you know, are there usage restrictions of this data? Um, marine data is usually covered 
by um, WMO regulations and their, ex their, their, their conventions where these have been exchanged um, because they're important for safety of life at sea. Um, that's changing. Um, well, the WMO data policy has actually become more, um, has enabled us to access more different types of data. But for example, with the move to autonomy, a lot of the data are, um, are collected by companies and become proprietary. So I think all we can do at the moment is work, for example, with the WMO to make sure that more different types of data are covered by, by free exchange, but also from a data management perspective, we need to make sure that that, that is clear in the archives. So, you know, we, we want to push to get, you know, so push to make data more accessible uh, and useful, but also um, be very clear about what we can yeah. use and what we can't. And this is a problem we haven't really had for marine data because of because of conventions, but I think it is, is raising its head and it's always been a problem for land data. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, a, a question about the, the Southern Ocean, because the Southern Ocean remains very data sparse throughout, I think pretty much throughout the whole period, even with Argo, it's still quite data sparse. So um, I guess, uh, how much of an issue is that? And is, is there any prospect for narrowing uncertainty in the Southern Ocean, or is it, are we sort of doing the best that we can there at the moment? So um, a lot of the modern data that we get from the Southern Ocean is from drifters, surface drifters, but they only measure typically sea surface temperature and pressure. Um, so we don't have the rich multivariate data we would like from ships, but you know, it, it's, it's all helpful. Um, interestingly, historically, we've had data from the Southern Ocean, uh, from whaling ships, and also because um, before the Panama Canal opened, for example, and the Suez Canal. So we, we have actually got periods where we do have data in the Southern Ocean. And then the challenge is, um, as, uh, as I, uh, in the answer to your first question, was the problem then is relating that to uh, conditions in the sort of the normal period, the climatological period. So you know, that's something that um, Tim Osborne's group have been wrestling with in, in the GLOSAT project. They've been trying to extend the uh, land station data back in time. Um, and, and we then have this issue about what do you do when you've got, you know, data available historically, but we haven't actually got any data at that location in the modern system. So that's the sort of thing that you have to, you know, that, that becomes part of the, um, you know, the data set construction part of things rather than the um the data uh data system side of things but um making you know the data as accessible as possible um you know and and searching out southern ocean sources uh is 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 the way forward there i think yeah okay thank you um a question about um standards and harmonization of, of data so how do you approach map mapping old data into modern standards um, and resolving issues between, um, say, how one, one old data set might map across where another one might not do so so easily? So how do you how do you tackle that? Uh, so so I'll answer a slightly different question uh, to start off with. So so one issue we have at the moment is that the data standard data formats we're using aren't ISO compliant. So we've ended up having data from modern data systems that are providing ISO compliant data and then having to map them back onto sort of somewhat archaic formats, uh, which, which has proved a, a huge headache um, mm -hmm. you know, and something that, that would just go away if we uh, modernized the data system. So, it, I mean, there's always a compromise. I mean, you know, to make things widely uh, you know, to be able to compare different things, you have to make approximations. So we have all this information about ship types, for example, and sometimes we have huge detail and we have to work out, um, you know, pull out the essence of the metadata, um, you know, and, and again, just do, do the best we can. Um, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, okay. Um, a question about tooling, if I may. Um, what what tools um, on, the, on the tools that you use? Which ones are found to be the best, and, and are they open source tools um, that are available to you? 
So at the moment, uh, we have typically a collection of tools that have been developed by you know, scientists and organisations working on the data. So for example, in Copernicus, we use the Met Office, uh, the, the uh, system that John Kennedy had developed to work with the um, historical data. Um, so what we have is a collection of software that people have used that is increasingly being made open source in that it's just being put on a, a Git repository um, and available for other people to use. But I think we're a little way off having things that are sort of robust um, and able to be used very much more generally. And I think that would be an important part of sort of developing this system is to, to bring together, you know, all of the, for example, all the different method approaches to QC or duplicate identification or visualization that we have, picking out the best, mm -hmm. Um, best features and actually building something, you know, a range of tools that are really robust. So we have open source data, but we don't really have, um, you know, tools that you could just expect anybody to use um, and, and get good results from. I think it's still in sort of the black arts sort of uh, area there. Yeah. Works cool. and a lot of benefits from doing it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and one one final question, then then we'll need to close. Um, I just wondered how satellite data interacts with any of this, and does it does it help you in any way with reducing uncertainties or or not? Is that a bit sort of circular in terms? No, of absolutely. So um, one thing that, that that we make a lot of use of is the ESA CCI satellite SST data, which gives daily a twentieth of a degree resolution uh, data uh, from Chris Merchant's team in Reading. Um, and that really helps us unpick the variability um, and we can use that where we have high quality data, we can try and use that as a comparison standard to understand, we understand the biases in the modern data, we can sort of project that information back in time. Um, one of the applications for this data is um, a lot of people, uh, typically for uh, variables like air temperature or humidity, uh, want to use these observations for satellite CalVal. So there's a sort of a virtuous uh, mm -hmm. a reinforcement there that we can use the data for calibration and validation of satellite data. And then we can also use the satellite data to improve our observations. And of course we can uh, uh, um, generate merged uh, hybrid blended yeah. data sets. Um, but mm -hmm. that's, uh, I've focus my attentions on the in situ observation survey. So, so ideally a, a data system that allows you to, to, to compare with many different data sources, including satellites, uh, a model output would be perfect.